just want to be Linda Stein. She wanted to be Linda Stein in all capital letters, and that's what she was. She had a certain style for a certain era. Until her trademark toughness earned her a dangerous enemy. My mom is in a puddle of blood. Can you help me? There were blunt force trauma wounds on her head. The investigation into her death would take police behind the closed doors of New York's elite into a world of entertainment, power, and betrayal. You know those Agatha Christie stories where a person gets killed and it turns out that everybody in the room had a motive? That's what this case was like. As I was always told, you never rule anybody out as a suspect. Tuesday, October 30th, 2007. It's the night before Halloween in one of New York City's most affluent neighborhoods. But for one family, a nightmare is unfolding. Just before 10.30 p.m., police receive an emergency call from a frantic young woman. Oh, my God, please. Police separated at 1142 at your emergency. Hello? Please, I need an ambulance. Okay, what happened then, ma'am? Uh, my mom, she's dead, I think. She said she came home and found her mother lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. She had no idea what had happened. Officers are immediately dispatched to the location, a penthouse apartment on the Upper East Side. As soon as they get there, they can see the victim is dead. No pulse, no breathing. But it's hard to tell what had happened because she's wearing some sort of sweatshirt hoodie and it's covering her head. There was a pool of blood on the floor, which could indicate a couple of things. In our training, we're not allowed to touch the body, so we have to actually wait for the medical examiner. Somebody could make the assumption that she possibly could have slipped and fell and banged her head. But a closer look reveals that this was no accident. That was all pretty much put to rest when they realized there were holes in the top of the hood because of multiple blunt force injuries. This woman did not fall. Someone beat her to death. Somebody being bludgeoned to death and their body left bloody in their own apartment. That just doesn't happen on Fifth Avenue. And the identity of the victim was even more surprising. One of New York's most notable celebrities 62-year-old Linda Stein. Everybody knew who Linda Stein was. She was sort of like one of the main characters in the ongoing soap opera that is New York City. You get these stories in New York of a certain period in the late 60s and early 70s of scrappy outer borough people who come into New York and seek their fortune, usually in entertainment. I'm talking about people like Neil Diamond or Carol King or Phil Spector. Well, Linda Stein was one of those people. The daughter of a kosher caterer, Linda was born in Manhattan, but raised in the Bronx. It's really basically the suburbs. And she had a very reasonable, middle-class, Jewish, ordinary, kind of boring life. After high school, Linda seemed content to stay close to home. In her 20s, she was teaching grade school in the Bronx, but that didn't last for long. In the late 60s, Linda's life took an unexpected turn when she met Seymour Stein, an up-and-coming music producer whose niece was in Linda's class. Seymour Stein's record label was Zaya Records, uh, one of the most progressive labels of its time. It still exists. They hit it off right away and began dating. Seymour introduced her to the New York music scene and she absolutely loved it. It didn't take long for her to quit her job as a school teacher. She went off to Manhattan and her life changed completely. She embraced rock and roll. She embraced the counterculture. She joined the underground at a time when the underground was the coolest thing, not just in New York, but in the whole world. Andy Warhol, the works, she was a big part of it. In 1971, 26-year-old Linda and 29-year-old Seymour decided to become partners, both in life and in business. Seymour's considered a musical guru. He discovered so many bands. 
Depeche Mode, he signed Madonna. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. They were two people from the neighborhood who had made it and become super cool in the coolest place in the world. And now they were married and a force to contend with. She started to accomplish things by herself. With her friend Danny Fields, she discovered the Ramones. Linda brought them all around the world and turned them into the biggest underground music act of the 70s. In addition to their music careers, Linda and Seymour had two daughters, Mandy and Samantha. But unfortunately, their marriage wouldn't last. The best way I could probably describe the marriage between Seymour Stein and Linda Stein is that it was kind of a 70s marriage, that even while they were married, they had extracurricular activities, that they raised a family together and remained devoted to their children, but that the marriage itself was kind of tenuous and elastic from the beginning. Linda and Seymour split in 1979, and though they remained friends, it wasn't exactly an easy divorce. It took something like 12 years for the divorce to go through, maybe because they were being combative with one another, but this wasn't a War of the Roses situation where they were tormenting one another. They also were raising daughters, and in fact, Seymour was actually helping Linda out in her business. After the breakup, Linda decided to launch a new career, this time in real estate. We met when I worked at Studio 54. As a realtor, connections are paramount. They're the most important thing, especially in a city like New York. And Linda knew everyone. Madonna, Sting, Billy Joel, Christy Brinkley, and the list goes on and on. Linda worked so many high-profile deals that in the 80s, she eventually became known as the real estate agent to the stars. She was also regularly featured in the gossip columns. She was in page six eight times in one year. She didn't just want to be Linda Stein. She wanted to be Linda Stein in all capital letters. And that's what she was in, in the 80s. Linda was kind enough after I got my license to take me on under her wing. With her brash style and fierce determination, Linda once again rose to fame and fortune. But her greatest challenge was yet to come in her late 40s. In the early 90s, Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer and went through two radical mastectomies. Linda was so determined to overcome any adversity. Very sweet in a lot of ways, but she was the toughest woman. She was cancer, gonna beat cancer. Linda survived breast cancer, but in 2005, doctors discovered a benign brain tumor that started causing more health problems. But any hope Linda might have had for a full recovery is now over. Instead, she's become the victim of a brutal attack, and investigators want to know why. She was brassy and confrontational with everyone. Those of us in the media were saying, well, this is Linda Stein. Who did she annoy? Who did she betray at the office? Or a lover, maybe, who she spurned? Maybe a rival real estate broker? You know, anything went in terms of the suspect list because this was Linda. Coming up, the list of enemies turns out to be longer than anyone expected. Even the people who loved her the most said that she was a verbally abusive person. Detectives in New York City are investigating the murder of 62-year-old celebrity real estate broker, Linda Stein. Their only witness is Linda's daughter, Mandy, who found her body and called 911. Mandy was a documentary filmmaker in Los Angeles, but she had been staying with her mother in New York while she was working on a film. She told police she had come home around 10.30 p.m. Mandy shows up at the penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue. She goes upstairs. She goes into the apartment, and she sees her mother lying face down in the living room with her sweatshirt pulled over her head. Mandy did state that she found her mother not breathing, and there was blood on the floor. She said she last spoke to her earlier in the day. Mandy Stein was very helpful in the investigation, giving us information of who was in Linda's life. But it took some time to get that information. She was very, very upset. As Mandy speaks to detectives, the medical examiner arrives to confirm the cause of death. She started going over the body. She removed the hoodie over the head. Once she started 
She noticed that there were lacerations on top of the head. They were ruling Linda Stein's death a homicide by blunt force trauma. It's not like she has one cut as she hit her head or something. There's multiple cuts on the back of her head. Blows from the back of the head. That is a, a possibility that was a surprise that that happened. She was bludgeoned, hit maybe six or seven times, police said, with some sort of heavy object. While Linda's body is removed for an autopsy, investigators begin searching for the murder weapon. We now know we're looking for some type of blunt object that could cause the injuries that killed her. We didn't have the murder weapon at all in the apartment. Our crime scene looked for it. They couldn't find anything. We also don't know exactly what we're looking for yet until we get to the autopsy. However, police do find several other clues. The fact that she had the hood over her head. I mean, in other cases, we've always taught that when somebody covers the face, it's usually because that person knows that person. There had been no forced entry and no sign of a struggle, so it appeared she let her attacker in. Usually when a sign of a struggle, you know, you would see like chairs knocked down, this knocked down, something broken. We really didn't see that somebody was in the apartment with her when this happened. It didn't apparently look like a robbery, so why would somebody kill this woman? I got a call from Linda's daughters, um, Samantha and Mandy, very early uh, Halloween morning. And I think it was um, Mandy who said to me, Mommy's dead. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? was completely incredible. You know, mommy is dead, mommy is dead. Widening their search, detectives canvassed the building in the hopes that one of the residents might have seen or heard something. The neighbors were shaken because it's such a nice neighborhood. And on top of that, the building is completely secure. Pretty much nobody makes a move without knowing who came in. Fifth Avenue in New York is probably everybody's last guess at where uh, unspeakable violent crime would take place. Unfortunately, no one describes seeing anything out of the ordinary. No one in the building they didn't recognize, no strange deliveries, nothing like that. However, investigators do learn that there is a long list of people who disliked Linda. We spoke to a number of employees of the building that would say that Miss Stein could be an abrupt person, sometimes have a nasty attitude towards people, and that made people feel uncomfortable. Even the people who loved her the most said that she was a verbally abusive person, said that she could be cruel to them all the time. Linda was a tough cookie. She had a certain style for a certain era. Linda could definitely, as much as I loved her, could definitely rub people the wrong way. She had a mouth, as they say. <laughs> In fact, police discover that Linda recently clashed with some of the construction workers who were renovating the building. They were putting a new roof on the building. There may have been as many as 30, 40 construction workers uh, that were in and out all day. The crew was working directly above Linda's penthouse apartment. She often complained about the noise, and she had a shouting match with some of the workers who one day showed up at her door unannounced. They got off the wrong floor. They knocked on the door. She felt, you know, they shouldn't even be there. Could Linda have pushed one of them too far? What we were learning is that they felt that Linda was mean to them. She would always curse them out because they were making so much noise. We were told that she would call them names. She would tell them to get the F out of here, stop making a racket. It was almost a daily thing. One thing that people were saying after Linda Stein died is maybe she finally ticked off the wrong person. Coming up, the list of suspects continues to grow. As I was always told, you'd never rule anybody out as a suspect. It's been several hours since celebrity real estate agent Linda Stein was found beaten to death in her penthouse apartment, and detectives have no shortage of potential suspects. You know those Agatha Christie stories where a person gets killed and it turns out that everybody in the room had a motive? Well, that's what this case was like, only the room was the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and the real estate business and the rock and roll business. 
at one point or another, this particular victim had made enemies of everybody in all of those worlds. We interviewed many people that are employed at the building, service-oriented people that did say that Linda Stein can be abrupt, can be nasty in the way she talks to people at times, and, you know, avoided it. Investigators are particularly interested in speaking to a group of construction workers Linda argued with several days before. It wasn't considered a manhunt looking for a individual because we had just so much to do with the people at the building. We had enough to do without saying we're going to be looking for a certain individual. We had to go through everybody first. We spoke to the elevator operator. We spoke to the super. Police found out that construction workers used a back service elevator and could only gain access to the apartments by a back door, and even then, the superintendent had to let them in. But when investigators check Linda's apartment, they find the service door bolted shut. The door was actually locked from the inside. There's only one key, and then you have the deadbolt, which there's no key for from the outside. When police tracked down all of the construction workers who had been working in the building that day, they all said none of them had ever even been inside Linda's apartment. From the interviews that were done, nobody could establish a motive that one of the workers were involved in killing Linda Stein. With the construction workers cleared, investigators turned their attention to who else was in the building that day. We started watching the surveillance footage once we established that it was a homicide, we did go with the super, and the super let us view the video. Since the elevator operator was able to identify everyone who came in and out of the building that day, he was able to help narrow down the search quite a bit. We spoke to him in regards to, besides Mandy, who came out before. He said it was only one other person who came in a couple times during the day, and that was uh, Natavia Lowry. Detectives learned that 26-year-old Natavia Lowry is Linda's personal assistant, hired by the real estate company Linda worked for. They hired a temp agency to help them procure personal assistance for some of their top brokers. If you did a certain amount of money, which Linda always certainly did, you were actually entitled to have an assistant that they would pay for. Of course police were going to want to talk to her because she had access in and out of the building, and most likely she was the last person to see Linda alive. When I first met Atavia, she was surprised about hearing this news that her boss was uh, murdered. She seemed upset, but she wasn't weeping. She was a very attractive young lady. She was a graduate of North Carolina State. She was very intelligent. She aspired, I believe, to be an actress. On the face of it, they may not have had a lot in common. An established celebrity real estate broker and a young woman who really has absolutely no job history or no career to speak of and comes from nowhere, from a mile away from Williamsburg out in Brooklyn. But on the other hand, they both are outsiders who have come into Manhattan. And it's just that Linda's a little further along the track. According to Natavia, working for Linda was often challenging, but always rewarding. She could be rude to some of the workers. She had witnessed that, but uh, overall, she got along with her. She told me uh, it, was a, it was tough, but she was learning a lot. It was not your typical business assistant job. It was almost like a home health aid job combined with clerical work and phone answering. According to Natavia, Linda smoked a lot of marijuana in order to deal with the pain, and she also required a lot of assistance. She's slowing down, but, you know, you, you can see when somebody has something major like a brain tumor, it affects them. She would set up Linda's appointments, do saw a lot of her bill paying, a lot of our financial stuff for the short time she was there. She would also do things like uh, get her lunch, do her makeup, anything that she would need. Investigators are particularly interested to know what she and Linda were both doing that day. Natavia said she had shown up at the apartment to take care of the normal chores, but like so many mornings, Linda wanted to take a power walk. Natavia indicated that uh, at some point during the day, Linda was going to go out and do one of those uh, fast-paced walks. I did her makeup, and I left the building a couple times to go to the office to get some supplies. 
When police asked Natavia how she got to work every day, she said she always walked, less for the exercise and more to save money. She said she expected to see Linda at the office later that day, but she didn't. She left Linda a long voicemail, a very routine, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum, hi, you know, but making it clear that she wasn't there, that she didn't see Linda, that Linda was out somewhere, and that she would see her tomorrow. When detectives ask her if she knows of anyone who might want to hurt Linda, Natavia tells them about a former lover. Raul, at age 49, was nearly 15 years younger than Linda. He started out as her protege, but in 2005, their relationship took a romantic turn. I remember staying at the house a couple of weekends in the Hamptons. Raul came to stay with Linda. He seemed to genuinely really like her a lot, yeah, that, that I could see. But according to Natavia, Linda had broken up with Raul when she discovered he was using her. He wasn't as into her as she was into him. In fact, he wanted her for her business contacts. The New York real estate industry is incredibly cutthroat. You're dealing with apartments and commissions that run into the millions and millions of dollars just for being someone's agent or just for selling an apartment. It makes you wonder if he wanted payback for Linda cutting him out of her life. Did he want to become the realtor to the stars? Coming up, the surveillance tapes lead to a startling revelation. She noticed something that nobody else picked up on, a reflection in the glass. On November 2nd, 2007, Linda Stein is laid to rest. Among the mourners are some of New York's biggest celebrities. It wasn't just celebrities. All of her family and friends and co-workers from the real estate agency were there as well. The thing that I remember most of all is standing in the back in the doorway crying was Natavia Lowry. It was wrenching, really, because this was an open murder case and nobody knew who did it. And her daughters both spoke. One spoke tearfully, the other spoke with rage about trying to find out who had done this to their mother. Linda's ex-husband, Seymour Stein, also spoke at the funeral and gave a very powerful eulogy. He was very emotional. He was in disbelief that something like this could happen. And this is years after they had been married. Linda's ex-husband and their two daughters are all cleared. Detective's best remaining suspect seems to be one of Linda's former lovers, Raul, who Linda had broken up with a year prior to the murder. If he was dating Linda only for her contacts in the real estate agency, then he lost his best chance at success when Linda broke up with him. But unfortunately, he didn't pan out as a suspect either. I did interview Raul. He was eventually ruled out. He could account for his time. I could account that he wasn't in and out of the building that day based on the video surveillance. So yes, he was one of the few personal friends that we spoke to that we ruled out as soon as we spoke to him. At that point, police were pretty much back at square one. So they went back to the security footage from the building, hoping they had missed something. Different detectives were watching 24 hours of video from five or six different cameras, 24 hours of sitting there watching. It takes time, it's tiresome. While that was going on, a forensics team went through every inch of Linda's penthouse apartment looking for clues. They did major surgery on that apartment. They were pulling door jams off the walls and they went into the bathroom and they pulled the entire basin going down into the drain to see if maybe somebody had left a hair or skin cells or anything that might connect Linda to someone else at the time of her death. Despite the massive effort, the team comes up empty-handed. But a few days later, police finally catch a break, thanks to one sharp-eyed investigator. She was looking at the video, and she noticed something that nobody else picked up on. The front glass door was opened by the doorman. And as it opened, it caught a reflection in the glass of Natavia getting out of a cab holding money in her hand. That was something that immediately stuck out to police because it contradicted part of her earlier statement. Discrepancy in her 
two prior statements was picked up. She had told us that she always walked wherever she went when she left the building that day of the murder, based upon what we saw on video. And it was the first time we were able to say, she's not telling us the truth about something. If Natavia had been caught on tape lying about taking a cab back to Linda's apartment that day, what else could she be lying about? When the autopsy report comes in, it contradicts another part of Natavia's story. She had stated that she put makeup on Linda before Linda left to walk to work. We had learned that her body was examined by the medical examiner's office and there were no traces of makeup on Linda that day. If it's just one of these things, you might think that she either misspoke or didn't remember correctly, but taken together, this was a major red flag. If people lie about the little things, there is potential that they could be lying about the bigger things. Everything needs to be investigated. On November 8th, 2007, nine days after Linda's murder, detectives sit down with Natavia for another interview. During the interview, we asked her about being truthful, about where she went when she left the building. Her bubbly demeanor started to diminish. She started to get upset when we started asking her about where she'd been. We know you weren't walking to work. We know you got into a car. We know it was a cab. Instead of answering, she'd ask for bathroom breaks. When she came back from the bathroom, she seemed much calmer. Detectives later learned she had used that time and used her phone to text her boyfriend in Virginia. They were talking about how much they loved each other. I uh, can't wait to see you. It's kind of interesting that that's what she would choose to do in the middle of an interview. But so be it. Since Natavia doesn't seem to be taking their questions seriously, investigators decide to turn up the heat. She started changing her story about the first interview she gave me. She started getting emotional. Natavia finally decided to come clean and tell police exactly what happened that night. And it was one hell of a story. Coming up, an unreliable witness becomes the prime suspect. I was mad. I was confused. I was angry. A little more than a week after Linda Stein was found brutally murdered, investigators have a suspect in custody. Linda's personal assistant, Natavia Lowry. She was close to Linda. It was known that she was one of the last people, if not the last person, to see Linda alive. When police hit her with all of the discrepancies in her story, she got very upset and said she would finally tell them exactly what happened. But what Natavia tells detectives sounds more like a bad dream than reality. She started talking about how ninjas came up through the back entrance. According to Natavia, she and Linda were in the apartment alone when a masked man burst in with a hammer and began attacking them. Told her they were going to harm her and her family if she said anything, and they killed Miss Stein. It was kind of an unbelievable story. It's tough to take in. Not only does Natavia's story about a killer ninja appear ridiculous, it's actually impossible because of all of the building's security cameras. We tried getting detectives into the building unseen by every entrance, and they got picked up on tape at some point in time. It's impossible to get into the building without being caught on tape. We pretty much told us, listen, no ninja came in. However... Their skepticism doesn't stop Natavia from concocting another tall tale. She said sometimes she would black out, and then she would wake up and be in these crazy rages. Listen, detectives, it's happened to me once before. It happened in college. I blacked out, and when I woke up, I was told that I was choking my roommate. So her story became, I didn't do anything to Linda, but if I did, I couldn't really remember because of all of these blackouts that I had. You probably would have told us earlier on if you blacked out of a medical condition. He says, that didn't happen. You know, it's the first time we're hearing about this. Faced with murder charges, Natavia decides to try one last version of events. The truth. 
There were no ninjas or blackouts this time, but she killed Linda out of self-defense. Linda Stein, who we all know, could be tough on people, was especially tough on her. Not just garden variety tough, but like racist tough. And that she couldn't take it anymore, and that she somehow snapped, and that this was an impulsive act and not a premeditated act. Natavia writes a signed confession, which she repeats for the district attorney on camera. I was mad. I was confused. I was angry, paranoid. It was like a feeling like I never had before. It was like, it felt like she was like my worst enemy, you know? Natavia claimed that Linda lashed out at her that morning, both physically and emotionally. She said that she felt demeaned by Miss Stein. She was blowing marijuana smoke in her face. It's like, I don't let her buy my lunch, you know? I buy my lunch, you know? And so she was like, hmm. that's the first I hear somebody black saving their money, right? So she's pointing the cane at me now. Right? So she just looks crazy right now. Her hand is, you know, going like that. And then she had like her, um, it's like a wooden baton type thing. Natavia described the baton as a stick that Linda used to help her with yoga stretches. It was like a cane, but without the handle, and Linda was swinging at her with it. I sit on the couch. So. She's like waving a cane and stuff at me. Then it's like, I don't know, like after that remark and stuff and, you know, her screaming and yelling, I just snatched it from her. I saw her took it and it's like, I just hit her with it. She said that she snapped, that this was an emotional act because she had been so terribly abused by Linda because Linda had blown pot smoke in her face, because Linda had made racial remarks against her. She said she just lost it. She just lost it. And once Natavia started hitting Linda, she couldn't stop. And I did it, like, a couple more times. On her head. After the first time she fell. And then you continued to hit her on the head with the stick? Yes. You know how many times you hit her? I wasn't myself. I don't... I can't count. The statement that we just taken puts a weapon in our hand, killing Miss Stein. On November 9th, 2007, 10 days after Linda was murdered, Natavia Lowry is arrested and charged with second-degree murder. By the time we took her out of the precinct, it was probably like 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. I thought back to seeing her there at the funeral, standing there in the back, crying. She wanted to be an actress. She was doing a great job up to a certain point. But we're better. Coming up, what appears to be an open-and-shut case is suddenly cast into doubt. Miss Lowry's confession should have never been obtained that way. 